issue. Um, I've had emails from people on sort of both sides of the argument, you know, that we should call for an immediate ceasefire and those that are very, very concerned that there are still hostages um, in Gaza. So it's been, it's been an absolutely horrible few months, but obviously it's even more horrific for the people actually physically involved. Well, why did it take the Labour Party so long to disown themselves from a bloke who pumped out vile conspiracy theories? Good question. I think the dithering was quite embarrassing for the party. I think there should have been a much quicker decision when it first appeared. OK, all right. And you think that Labour clearly is going to now be coming under the cosh, aren't they, from a lot of independent candidates, a lot of pro-Palestine candidates, some yeah. big names potentially on the chop here, by the way. I mean, West Streeting spending off um, uh, an independent candidate. Roshanara Ali and Bethnal Green is actually seriously facing stiff competition, believe it or not, uh, from Shamima Begum's lawyer, who's decided to stand against her. And there is the MuslimVote.co.uk that are now trying to uh, manage to accumulate as many voters independent to vote on, on Muslim issues. They're predominantly coming after Labour seats. How do you find that off. It's going to be really interesting in the next few months. I think this issue is going to grow. Um, we obviously do not want a single other child in Gaza killed, but we also know that Israel have to get their hostages out somehow, and that mm. figures coming out you know, of Palestine about the deaths from Hamas are really not to be trusted, not to be believed. So the whole situation is completely hideous. I've just got a statement here uh, from Azar Ali, who has since released a statement in which he apologises for his comments. He said, I apologise unreservedly to the Jewish community for my comments, which were deeply offensive, ignorant and false. Hamas, horrific, Hamas is a horrific terror attack with the responsibility of Hamas alone, and they are still holding hostages who must be released. And there are candidates standing in the Rochdale by-election. We've got Azir Ali, Independent, Mark Coleman, Independent, Simon Danchuk, Reform UK, Ian Donaldson, Liberal Democrat, Paul Ellison, Conservative, George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain, Michael Howarth, Independent, William Howarth, Independent, Guy Otten, Green Party, Ravin Rodent, Subortner, Official Monster Raving Looney Party, and David Tully, who is an independent. Um, OK, so, Rosie, I've got one more question to put to you, please, based on what Rishi Sunak has said tonight at our People's Forum. I know this yeah. is an issue that's very, very close to your heart. So, the Prime Minister was responding to something about the trans issues. OK, I just want to play the clip and then I'll, I'll get you off the back of it. Sure. I really don't think anything I just said, quite frankly, should be controversial. Are we respectful and tolerant of people and their differences, it's particularly when they're going through things that are sensitive? Yes, of course we are. Do we think it, biological sex was important when we're thinking about women's safety, women's health? Yes, of course, I think most people would think that is important. And in particular, I think these things are important when we're considering our children which is why we've recently published guidance for schools about how to deal with these issues in our classrooms. Well, Rosie, that's the leader of the Conservative Party there being quite clear on what a woman is. I wish your leader could make his mind up. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't. We haven't exactly been clear on those issues, have we, for the last few years? But, I mean, what can I say? I think we're still in a bit of a mess about it, to be completely honest. Um, you had someone there who is actually a sort of quite well-known trans rights activist, and she seemed fairly kind of satisfied with that answer. So I'm not sure sitting on the fence in this issue is, is really winning the Labour Party any friends. But, Rosie, is this not a bit of a theme with Labour sitting on the fence? And I'm kind of excluding you from this, Siley, because I know that you do wear your <laughs> heart and your views on your sleeve, to be fair. But, yeah, um, you know, when I it do. comes to a, a catalogue of Keir Starmer's screeching U-turns, the left one being, of course, over uh, the environment and the, and the green budgeting the £28 billion, which Rishi Sunak did raise there. I mean, what are people voting for, Rosie, when they're voting Labour? Seriously? Um, I'm not here as a Labour spokesperson and I don't have any sort of input into the uh, future manifesto as a backbencher, but I know that a lot of Labour MPs would really like some clarity on our policies going forward because we're always asked about it. I was really disappointed with the scrapping of the, of the Green pledges, um, as were lots of other vocal Labour MPs. So it would be nice to get a bit more clarity on those issues, a bit less fence-sitting in the next few months. And we're going to have to do that, aren't we, so people know what we stand for. Yeah, uh, but crucially, at the, at the moment, you don't really know what Labour stands for as a Labour MP. Not on some of the bigger issues, no. I think people are obviously developing our manifesto, so hopefully we'll hear that quite soon.
All right, hopefully. Well, I'll talk to you about it then, Rosie. Thank you very much. It's enlightening stuff. That's Rosie Duffield there, uh, the Labour MP. Thank you very much. Uh, well, James is still with me now, James Daly, the new brand well, spanking. Well, you've, well, listen, we've, we've heard it all now. We've got a Labour MP saying they don't know what the Labour Party stands for. And if, if Keir Starmer could just inform Labour MPs what his policies are, we might get some understanding of what it is. The king of the U-turns, I mean, it's not in terms of somebody like me, a Conservative MP. Even his own MPs don't know what he believes in. So that's the nature of the beast that you're talking about. Not from me, Patrick, from Rosie. I, I, I was quite surprised by that, but, I mean, she's nothing if not honest, to be fair. Well, Rosie, no, listen, it, Rosie it? is honest, and she's honest about oh. Keir Starmer, a man who oh. changes his mind every other day. Well, can anybody all trust right. what he says? Oh, all right, well, now, look, I cut you off a little bit earlier on when we yeah. were talking about the NHS. Now, Rishi Sunak did blame the NHS waiting list, which is still at a record level, on striking workers, essentially. Is that fair? Can you really yes. seriously be pinning it on striking workers? Do you 100%. Think? Let me give you. Let me give you the, 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 when you not cut me off when we when we were inter when we were interrupted. <laughs> During the month of November, when there weren't strikes, the backlog went down by 100,000. Yeah. Shock horror. We don't have strikes. The backlog is coming down at a significant rate. I also wanted to point out, which is not point out much in this debate, is for the last three months the backlog has come down, even though more procedures are being cancelled because of the doctors' strike. Mm. The doctors, you know, we all want to see an end to this, but it is directly linked to the junior doctors, you know, decision to go on strike, and this is the consequence of that. The government are doing everything they can to come to a um, a deal with the junior doctors, which is going to protect the public, because that's what we're interested in. We we want to have a deal that gets people back to work, that ensures that the public are protected, and we can continue doing the work. As I said, in November, the backlog went down for about 100,000 when the doctors weren't striking. And I hope, I'm sure this is not the case, Patrick, I am sure this is not the case, but I hope we can take the politics from the doctor side out of it in respect of this and actually deal straightforwardly and forthrightly with a government that wants to come to a deal that's fair for all sides. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, given what West Streeting has been saying about the NHS and opening the door for privatisation. I think it is yeah, unfortunate, and, and but it's, it's only really in this country that we live in now, only really a Labour health secretary that can say that. I'm going to have to leave you there, James, I'm afraid. But thank you very, very much. That is James Daly there, who is the brand spanking new Deputy Party Chairman for the Conservatives and the Tory MP for Bury North. But look, I've got a whopping great big show still to come because top pollster Matt Goodwin is beaming him live from the People's Forum. Why? We've done our very own exit poll. The People's Vote is in. Has the Prime Minister managed to convince anyone of that room full of undecided voters to vote for him? I think those results will be fascinating. Plus, the Minister for Common Sense, Esther McVeigh, no nonsense to say the least, joins me with her assessment of the Prime Minister's performance tonight as the Conservative Party risks losing some big names at the next election. If you missed this today, those include Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. They do also include Jacob Rees-Mogg. Mm, but first, tonight's panel of leading pundits will be here with their expert analysis of the Prime Minister's performance. Those include, of course, Carol Malone. They've also got Mike Buckley, former Labour Party advisor and former Brexit Party MEP, Belinda DeLucy. Blink and you miss it tonight. Patrick Christie's tonight. We're only on GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, oh. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney. Weekdays from 3 p.m. Or they're trying to make it better, or they're trying to make it slower, a lot slower. Slower enough, in fact, for it to sufficiently allow the boats to start coming in to cause further political damage to Rishi Sunak. Which is it will this? do if it carries Of course on. it will. And this is the Labour peers, the Lib Dem peers, and no doubt some of the Conservative wets, bandying together, causing political damage to Rishi Sunak. And the, the longer it goes on, the worse it will be mm. for the Conservative party. There's now a deadline on the Rwanda plan. It's got to start working this summer to have any electoral benefit for Richie Sunak because, of course, if the election is in November, by then the, the crossings will slow down. It's got to, get, got to be up and running by about May or June and, and then they'll take it from there. Cool. And you have a crumb of comfort for us. Richie Sunak met a Prime Minister. Well, a crumb of comfort for, for those who want to stop the boat, certainly, or we'll get towards it. The PM today met um, Alexander de Croo, who's a Belgian um, a Prime Minister. They've agreed a UK-Belgium law enforcement cooperation agreement. In short, that is a focus on surveillance 
evidence and information ultimately which should help stop the boats. Not many boats make crossings from Belgium, but it's the kind of they can hopefully use law enforcement. These are the kind of deals which Sir Keir Starmer's talking about. If he becomes Prime Minister, he'll do more of these deals with, um, with um, uh, countries on the continent. And this shows that the, the PM, the Tory PM, can do them too. And there may be um, intelligence sharing of crime gangs that operate yes. within Belgium. As you say, it's a much, much further distance, a much more parallel across the North Sea. Very unlikely that people will be leaving in any great numbers from Belgium. Mm. But nevertheless, is this of note or is it, is it a token well, victory well, against you know, a backdrop of domestic it's loss? It's they can do it with Belgium and not do it with the European Union because so far we've been told the returns agreements can't be agreed with individual countries because they've got the European Union, Union to talk to. Maybe this deal can be mirrored with France and that might help with better cooperation because basically after Brexit we're a sovereign country. We, we have to work on some areas more closely with our, with our, our, our European neighbours. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, it's all go here on Patrick Christie's tonight because Rishi Sunak was grilled by the audience on his Rwanda plan today. One voter asked whether or not he was adamant enforcing through this Rwanda plan, why he was so adamant about it all. We're going to be playing that a little bit later on, but I'm going to take you right back to our venue now in the North East with our political editor, Christopher Hope, who is joined, is joined, I think, by a couple of people, a couple of these undecided voters who were in that audience. A quick reminder for you, by the way, that we've got this exit poll of people who are uh, telling you whether or not they were convinced by Rishi Sunak. Let's go to Christopher Hope. Go on, Chris, take it away. I'm joined here by Jill Clough, Patrick. Now, Jill, you were a voter who voted Conservative in 2017. 2019, big question, would you vote Conservative this year for the, for the election? Well, at the moment, after this, no, probably not. But I've still got an open mind, so um, if more uh, decent policies emerge, then yes, I'd, I'd be persuaded. You've come all the way from Milton Keynes to be here. What's it like seeing the PM up close? Was he a different person to the one who you see on TV all the time? No, no. He was very similar, very likeable. He only mentioned that his mother had a pharmacy three times, which I was quite pleased about. <laughs> um, I felt that he didn't answer all the questions. The ones he wanted to avoid, he avoided. The one about the COVID vaccine was particularly shocking. I don't know if the cameras caught the two men who were talking about it. They had been so severely affected and he just talked about the uh, vaccine um, compensation. Which... He seemed a bit stoned by that. I mean, when, he, when that question was asked, the questioner left the room before he even asked his question. I'm not sure he's at all prepared for that question. No, no, he, he wasn't. You could see it on his face. Um... And otherwise, you're going back to Milton Keynes tonight, a lot to think about. What do, you, what do you think? What does he need to do to win you over? I think he needs to stop trotting out the same old policies, the same five pledges, and actually listen to what the people want and act on it. Okay. Well, there we have. That's Jill Clough in the audience there. A Tory voter in the last two elections isn't still convinced by him. We'll have results of our poll as people left, Patrick. But I, for me, I thought it was a convincing display from the Prime Minister. He, uh, he was trying to really steer people to say, if you vote for Reform Party, you're voting for Keir Starmer. Don't mm. wreck the plan, he's saying. Give us more time. And that, for me, says an election later this year, nowhere near May, as thought about over the weekend.
Yeah, look, Christopher, thank you very, very much. Christopher Hope there, our political editor who's been at that event for us. Reminder, the exit poll results, which, uh, by the way, I have seen, and are quite surprising, but I'm not going to reveal them to you just yet. And Richard Tice is coming down the line as well. That leader of Reform UK that Rishi Sunak is now begging Conservative voters not to vote for. He says it'll open the door to Keir Starmer. And I've got Cabinet Minister Esther McVeigh coming your way. But right now, let's get some expert reaction from my top panel. We've got Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, journalist and commentator Mike Buckley, and former Brexit Party MEP Belinda De Lucy. Uh, now, Rishi Sunak was asked a bit about the Labour Party, OK? And, uh, well, I'll just throw you over now to what he had to say. He basically said, they're in absolute chaos. Let's hear from the Prime Minister and we'll get the reaction. The Labour Party hasn't changed. It's not change, it's a con, right? And that's what you have to remember. A vote for anyone who's not me, who's not your Conservative candidate, is a vote to put him with his values and his party in power. You saw it last week, what that would mean for the economy. Can't tell you how he's going to pay for £28 billion decarbonisation policy, which means higher taxes for you and everyone else. Stood by this person in Rochdale until the media pressure got too much. Like, that's the values. Has doing everything he can right now to frustrate the passage of our Rwanda bill in the House of Lords. Do you want... There are two things to go out there. The first one being that he thinks that the Labour Party obviously don't have a plan. The second one being, please don't vote for Richard Tice. Carol, <laughs> the Labour Party, do you think he's right about that? I mean, have they got a plan? More screeching U-turns from Sturmer? No, I think he's right. They don't have a plan. However, I, I think people, Tory voters didn't turn up there, the undecideds to hear him slagging off Starmer. They turned up to hear what the Tories have got to offer. And, and I'm not sure... And that lady, that last lady you had there just said it. She said, I'm still undecided, but until I, until I hear some new policies, that's what people want. They want new policies, they want energy, they want oomph, they want pizzazz. Mm. Now, he, he came across, I thought, tonight as very likeable. I, I thought he was, he was more, he was more likeable. I think a small group suits him better than a big group, so he was good. But he did, he was still trotting out the same old stuff. And I don't like it when another party leader attacks another party leader. Give us what you've got. Don't tell us the bad points about Starmer. We all know them. You know, the people who are not Labour, who don't like Starmer, know what he did last week in the 28th bill. They, they know he doesn't cost his policies. What we want to know, Rishi, is what you're going to give us come the election. And that lady said, it. come up with some great policies and I'll vote for Tories. Mike, what do you make of that performance from our Prime Minister? I see you've turned up wearing your Tory tie tonight. <laughs> I not go that far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't see the whole thing, but the bit I saw I thought was incredibly poor. I mean, the way that he reacted to the gentleman who was complaining about the COVID vaccine, I thought was particularly bad. Why? Go on, well, why? Did he why? Do? He didn't... He didn't in any way have an emotional response to him. I mean, it was just, well, we're doing enough. No. You know, and that's so often their response. When, he when he's attacked on something, he he's like, I'm, we're doing enough already, move on. Sorry. He didn't want to engage with it. He said, I'm very, and his very question, sorry. That was well, an emotional response. Well, hardly. Well, um, so what would you like him to have done? I would like him to have taken more account of that person's circumstances. But the other point that I wanted to make is when he, the woman asked about the NHS, the fact that it's in a complete state, waiting list, the highest they've ever been, he we just found out... He blamed the striking out. workers. He blamed the striking... He, first, he blamed the striking workers, but then the woman said, to him, well, what would you do? You know, how will you fix the NHS? His answer was, you can go to the pharmacist and get cough medicine without going to get a GP appointment first. Mm. What? How is that a response to the gargantuan crisis that we face that is, by the way, causing loads of people to have long-term mental health problems? We're losing people earlier than we should, as in people are dying earlier than they should because they can't get the health care that they need. It's having a... Con not that it's the most important thing, the lives are the most important thing. It's having a consequent impact on the economy because you've got lots of people off long-term sick who can't work. OK. Now, Belinda, he said that Please, please, please don't vote. I'm paraphrasing. Please, please, please don't vote for Richard Tice because you'll open the door to the Labour Party. We do have Richard Tice from Reform UK on very shortly. Do you think that anyone will listen to him and say don't? It's such a shame that the Conservative Party have resorted to this kind of threatening, uh, gosh, if you don't vote for us, then this is what you're going to get, rather than selling themselves. And the point is they can't sell themselves anymore because most of the promises and pledges they make to people, they can never get through because they've decided never to reset the civil service, who are always going to hinder any of their slightly right-wing policies anyway. Very weak, very timid. Reform UK offers such a, a larger democratic choice for the people and why are the Tories scared of us? Why can't they sell themselves on their own policies? Because they know they can't push through things like lower immigration and stopping, their, stopping the boats. It's all waffle, Patrick, from, from Rishi. He's a very sweet, affable okay. guy, but it came, well, came across as the usual waffle. One of the policies that Rishi Sunak has absolutely staked his claim on is Rwanda, OK? Mm -hmm. And he was asked tonight about Rwanda. Here's what he said, and then I'll get your reaction. I think illegal migration 
is profoundly unfair. Right? I actually think our country is based on a sense of fairness. Right? We are a people that we wait our turn, we put in our fair share, we play by the rules. Right? And illegal migration actually breaks that sense of fairness, it erodes a sense of trust in our system. OK, so, Carol, mm -hmm. Richie Sunak there saying that he thinks Rwanda will work and it's absolutely fine and it'll go ahead. We have seen the quotes and quotes Rwanda files here at GB News, which appear to mm -hmm. suggest that they are anticipating a backlog of 150,000 mm -hmm. by 2026 and a maximum amount of people of 500 to be sent to Rwanda in the first year. I mean, is that success, really? Can we believe it? It's not success, but what, the way I think he summed up the, how British people think about illegal immigration is spot on when he said they think it's profoundly unfair. They do, because we do have a sense of fair play in this country about genuine um, refugees. We do want to take care of those people, but we're sick of being scammed by the economic migrants. And, and I think he's absolutely right when he says that we like to play by the rules and that's not what's happening. Um, but, you know... I wasn't aware that we could only send 500 people to Rwanda, which, I, which is shocking if we're going to have that kind well, of... Well, the backup. government deny it. They say it's more, but we've seen... Well, Nigel Farage has revealed the documents. But... but he needs to... And he didn't talk about the wider problem of immigration, both legal and illegal, because the legal mm -hmm. one is way more serious than a few people coming across on the boat, although a lot of people feel very badly about that. But I think he should have tackled the wider issue on immigration as well and told us how he was going to cut this. Well, and I think one of the reasons why he didn't actually is because I don't think he actually cares too much about legal immigration. And that is from what I've been told by our former immigration minister, who said, Mike, when he sits around the cabinet table, he does not hear people who, frankly, live in a Surrey bubble caring about legal immigration. Well, the government have not been honest with us the whole way through. We have an ageing population. We have a need for working age people in this country if the economy is going to function, if the NHS and social care is going to function, and many other, every other part of society as well. The government know that, which is why they've been running around the world giving out visas like the confetti. We do need people to come. But instead of being honest with the British people and having a debate, immigration goes up when they say, oh, how terrible, something must be done, while not recognising that they're the government. And on the subject of Rwanda, that, I mean, the policy is probably not going to get through the Lords. Mm. It's certainly never going to work, and it certainly wouldn't do, as you say, do anything to about asylum seeking, which, by the way, is fully legal uh, in this country. OK. One of the clearest signs a government has failed its own people is by depending on cheap foreign labour rather than investing in their own workforce. So when you say, oh, they need to be honest, that, that we need the stuff, no, we don't. We have the people here. So it's a failure of our government that they won't focus on a British workforce. And I'd say very quickly, mm. one of the questions I would have loved to have asked Rishi was why, when Macron stands up to the Strasbourg court and deports criminals against their judgments, do our government... Why are they so spineless that they won't do the same to protect the British people here? And Rishi has no answer to any of that. No, and also, as well, the question, really, that I would like to ask is, if a man from Afghanistan comes over to this country right now, even with Rwanda in place, and kills somebody mm -hmm. and has their asylum yep. claim uh, rejected, under our current plans and under the Rwanda plan, realistically, we still couldn't deport that man, could we? And the answer to that really is no. And if the answer to that is no then we've still got a massive problem. So, there we go. Look, coming up, Reform UK leader Richard Tice tells me why he has the answers to the questions thrown at the Prime Minister. He's certainly giving Rishi sleepless nights, isn't he? But next, expert pollster Matt Goodwin. He's looking ahead to the results of our bombshell exit poll. How many of those undecided voters did the Prime Minister convince to vote for him? And after that, it is the Minister for Common Sense, Esther McVeigh, Cabinet Minister for you, live on this show, joining me to give her reaction. Uh, and also she's going to tackle the woke extremist culture eroding the British Army, at least. That's according to Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. Should our armed forces focus less on diversity and more on defending the nation? It's Patrick Christie tonight. I'll see you in a tick. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. The Camilla Tomini Show, Sunday mornings from 9.30. Yeah, I appreciate the story it isn't in today's papers, but it has been running all week. And it's yes. this row over um, the use of nitrogen hypoxia to kill this man who was on death row in... Um, Alabama. Alabama, yeah. And it's been linked back to you, and I wanted to ask you about it, because this is intriguing, because you did a television show back in 2015 where you, I believe, tested this method 
of execution. Just tell me briefly about it, Michael. What happened? I didn't test this method of execution, and it was a bit longer ago than that. But what I did do was test hypoxia. So for I, I tested various ways in which people uh, are killed in the United States and, and asked the question as to whether there was a hum more humane way of doing it. So I was put into hypoxic situations, for example, into a chamber run by the Netherlands Air Force, which simulated what happens if you're in an aircraft at 30,000 feet and suddenly the windows blow out. And what happened to me was that I was almost instantly rendered incapable. Uh, as an experiment, I was trying to play with children's toys, putting triangle shapes into triangle spaces. And I, I was quickly unable to do that. I was asked, what is nine minus five? And I said five. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the officer who was with me, the uh, Air Force officer who was wearing an oxygen mask said to me, Michael, put your mask on or you will die. And I was incapable of putting my own mask on. Now, this suggested that hypoxia was very fast acting yeah. and that you had, obviously I was in no pain or anything no. like that, I was just completely unaware. By the way, this is why if you're on an aircraft and, and it depressurizes, you must put your own mask on first. But of okay. course, I can't, I can't go on and draw conclusions. No. We, we did not experiment with nitrogen. But what I can say is it was, it was evident to me that hypoxia renders you incapable almost instantaneously. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Coming up, leader of Reform UK, Richard Tice, who was name-checked by Rishi Sunak there. How would he have answered some of those questions that you, the wonderful people, put to our Prime Minister? But first, we've got more reaction now to the People's Forum with leading pollster Matt Goodwin. We will be releasing our exit poll results at 10. But did the Prime Minister manage to win anyone around in that audience of undecided voters? Sunak will certainly hope so, but the latest polls, official polls anyway, by Redfield and Wilton strategy showed the Tories have slumped to their lowest rating since he became Prime Minister. Labour now have a 25-point lead. Matt Goodwin was in the audience there. Matt, did he do anything to convince voters for you? Well, I've got to say, Patrick, I was in the room uh, up here in uh, Darlington. And, and, look, I'll be honest with you. To me, the Prime Minister sounded a little flat. He only got one laugh out of the audience. He's got two rounds of claps, but that came quite late on. He, he struck me more as a chancellor than a prime minister, if I'm honest. There wasn't much in the way of charisma. There wasn't a compelling story, a big vision to go to the country with. So I, I think probably his team will be leaving today thinking, you know, he did a competent job, but it wasn't a particularly compelling job. OK, just one more quick one with you, Matt, whilst I've got you before we go to those exit poll results at 10. Um, another poll has been published today saying that the public think that Rishi Sunak cares less than the rest of his party about ordinary people. So they also think the Prime Minister cares less than other Tories about the NHS. He was asked a question about the NHS tonight and he was meeting ordinary people. Do you think he's answered any of those things? On the NHS, it's always going to be difficult for Rishi Sunak. That, to be frank, Patrick, that is Labour's issue. The Conservatives is, are going to really struggle to win on that issue. So I, I, think he, I think he knows that. You know, he talked about 
developing these bespoke clinics. He talked about investing in lots of things that people wouldn't currently be aware of. And he talked about trying to bring down the waiting list. And he accepted, you know, it's going to take over 10 years for some of these new consultants mm. to come through. It was all a bit of a, he reminded me of a technocrat, Patrick, rather yeah. than a compelling prime minister. I was thinking, how would Tony Blair have done in this forum? How would have, you know, Gordon Brown, right. some of the big beasts in British politics? And I think, you know, they probably would have had a bit more of a, a charismatic punch, shall we say, than what we saw this evening. Well, if you're saying he's less charismatic than Gordon Brown, then good grief, maybe he's in more trouble than we thought. But, Matt, thank you very much. I'll be seeing you a little bit later on, OK? We've got this exit poll result. How did he do when it came to convincing people in that audience of undecided voters to vote Tory? But Rishi Sunak has been spending the evening up north. Absolutely, I wish I was in some ways, my, my natural homeland. But he's been trying to convince those voters to go and vote for him at the ballot box. But some Tory big hitters risk losing their rural seats at the next election. This was revealed today. Jacob Rees-Mogg, Therese Coffey, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, apparently they would be booted out by constituents if the latest polls are accurate. I'm delighted to welcome Cabinet Minister Esther McVeigh, who was recently appointed as Sunak's, well, what should we say, common sense czar. Esther, look, thank you very, very much. Well, over half of Tory's traditional countryside seats are at risk. Are you worried about that? Well, look, we always want to uh, get the vote, best vote we possibly can, but can I just check you on one thing that you said a little bit earlier, and it's not like you, Patrick, to not have all your facts right, but oh. you said Rishi was doing nothing about legal migration and right. considerable changes came in in January and that was dependence, that was about the money you had to earn or your sponsors had to earn and squeezing down on students coming into this country which will stop, it's already started that policy and it will stop 300,000 people coming here. So I just have to say that because what you well, said before was incorrect. Well, well it's still, okay, well with respect though Esther, there was a bit of rowback then wasn't there on the salary threshold and also there was a little bit of a rowback on the length of time it was going to take to actually implement some of those things and that would still bring the net migration figure down to around the 400,000 a year mark which many people do think is too high Esther. Yeah so down 300,000 is a lot and all I'm saying is I just want to get that right on the record because you're brilliant right and that's not like you not to quite get that right and I just have all to right. get that right because uh, uh, taking all... legal migration down by 300,000 is considerable. It is considerable. Oh, look, again, many people will still think that 400,000 is too high, but the Prime Minister was asked about... It is. About, uh, uh, it is too high. It is too high, and we're going to get that down, too. Right, OK. Well, the Prime Minister was asked about Labour's plan to introduce VAT tax on private schools. He said that it was an attack on hard-working parents like his who struggled to send their kids to a fee-paying school. I'll play the clip, Esther, and I'll get you to react. You know, I get attacked by Keir Starmer because of where I went to school. And I said to him once, actually, I said, you're not really attacking me, you're attacking my parents. And you're attacking everybody like them that works hard to aspire for a better life for them and their family. I think that's wrong. I don't think it's British. And that's not the type of country that I'm going to build. Has he got a point? Absolutely, he has. And by the way, my parents would have been one of those parents. I'll yeah. tell you for why. Because Labour was messing around with the whole educational system and was destroying a lot of the state schools. So my parents, who didn't have anything, really didn't have too much. I'd been in care, right? So they got themselves on track. Dad set up a business and he thought, I want more for my child than me. So he sent me to a fabulous school in Liverpool called Belvedere. So what uh, Keir Starmer is going to do is stop aspirational families, people who want the best for kids, who sacrifice lots of other things to send their kids to a school, because we believe education is the mm. best thing you can give to your kid. And what, not more than that, though, what about all of the kids who are in private school who are now going to have to go to state school, which I believe the figure is going to cost about £7 billion. So mm. not only is it wrong, for aspiration, it's wrong financially, and it's wrong for the whole of the educational sector. Again, talk, talk, but actually never know how they're going to pay for things. Yeah, I mean, it does genuinely actually seem like quite a harebrained policy, I'll be honest with you, and whether or not the U-turn on that, we'll have to wait and see. Labour, of course, think it's great and would deny everything that we've just said. Moving on, Grant Shapps has warned that a woke and extremist culture has infiltrated the British Army after it was revealed that mm. army bosses had plotted relaxing security checks to improve diversity. Esther, I mean, this is in your wheelhouse, isn't it? As, you know, the, the quotes on quotes Minister for Common Sense. Come on, what are we going to do about this? Well, we want the best person for the job, not 
somebody who fits a quota for the job. And actually, the Defence Secretary, Grant Chaps, has been right on the case saying, no, he'll do a long-term light review on what's going on, but immediately we've got to stop this craziness. We want the best people for a job and not some fixed uh, quota. I think that is what is essential. I think it does speak, though, doesn't it, to a mindset, the fact that this was even floated, the fact that this was even the idea to begin with. And we're seeing this right across a load of different departments at the minute, Esther, which is you know, diversity first, quality second. And this has to stop now. I mean, how was, it, how was this allowed to happen under a Conservative government, for goodness sake? Well, it has um, expanded over time, you're right. And I think we have got to say now, look, I know Labour brought the Equality Act back in and back in 2010, but look how it spread. But look, I'm in there to look at equality, diversity, inclusion uh, quotas. And actually, if they're not working mm. and people aren't doing the job at hand and we haven't got the right person doing the job, then we've got to get rid of all of that. And what I will say, Rishi is very strong uh, on this. And what does he want to do? It is getting the economy on track. It is getting immigration down. And it is making the country great again. And all I will say is Mr. Flipflop, did, uh, that's Keir Starmer there, did his latest flip -top to, flip flop tonight in Rochdale. Indeed. There he was, standing by his candidate. He's changed that. A day doesn't go by mm -hmm. without him flip -flopping. And one further thing about COVID, COVID vaccine damages. I saw that question in the audience there. And I actually have been working with a Conservative right. group, with a Conservative right. MP, Christopher Chope, on that, sorting okay. out those vaccine damage payments. Uh, Esther, thank you very much for your time, as ever. And it wouldn't be an interview without getting at least one death stare out of you. So there we go. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful Esther McVeigh. It's a wonderful Esther McVeigh there. And um, people we've got to no, we've got to go, Esther. We've got to no, go no, on. Honestly, your interview with Anne uh, and Stephen oh, on okay. Saturday, right. the mail on Sunday. Can I just say, right. powerful? And how strong were you and Emily right. to talk about that? Right. And I just say it was amazing. Oh, all right. Well, thank you very much, Esther. Uh, you take care. Right, OK, look, we're going to have to be very quick. In fact, I'm going to skip through all the teases because I'm just going to tell you that when I come back, I've got Richard Tice, the leader of Reform UK, who is keeping Rishi Sunak awake at night. Stay tuned. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Are you across this microaggression story? I, I'm across microaggressions. It's I'm also it's across it's XL bullies. Ridiculous. You would not last five minutes. Oh, for God's so sake, civil servants, give me strength. So civil servants have been taught not to roll their eyes, <laughs> something you do very well. We both do it quite a lot, actually. Because it's seen as an act of microaggression. This, By the way, this cost <laughs> the taxpayer, this yes? training, £160,000. What the hell is going on in our woke civil service? Who Ooh. cares if someone rolls their eyes okay. in exasperation? What, <laughs> what the hell is going on in our civil service, full stop, if the way that civil servants are communicating with each other is rolling their eyes and looking at their phones? I mean, is the government being run by people who are essentially acting to each other like stroppy teenagers? Yeah. But I, I, I'm all right with people, mm. because, you see, I would be in defence of ro eye rolling. So, me, it's me too, because, I couldn't care less. But do you know why? Because I want people to give me their genuine reaction. As long as it's mm. not deeply offensive. But I want to know how people feel. And what they're being told here, civil servants are being taught, and of course this is an, a, an area of employment law because people are taking cases against their bosses who roll their eyes at them. They're saying they're being encouraged um, to uh, say nothing and nod their heads to promote transparency and inclusion. Don't show what you really think, just nod your head. Mm. 
But I think that comes with then saying what you really think. And this is this is the key problem and what these uh, what these courses are, are trying to establish. And I looked into some of them uh, when I was uh, when I was researching this. And it's not saying hide what you're feeling. It's saying rather than huffing and puffing and rolling your eyes, if you've got a disagreement with someone, say I've got a disagreement with someone. But because otherwise you can't have an effective workplace if people are sort of just passively, aggressively huffing at but each why other. Why do these civil servants need to be taught this? <laughs> Why do people need to be taught this? This is just normal discourse in a normal working day. You don't need a seminar on it. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Time now for reaction to Rishi Sunak's People's Forum from the man waiting in the political wings to topple him. It's the man who holds all the cards, apparently. It's the leader of Reform UK, Richard Tice. Well, Richard, your reaction to Rishi Sunak saying that a vote for reform would let Keir Starmer into number 10, that's a problem for you. He was petrified, wasn't he? He wouldn't mention the name reform. He'd clearly been trained not to mention it because he knew exactly what the audience were thinking, were asking, the applause when that question was, was significant. Look, people are bored of hearing him bang on. He's got a plan and it's working. No, it's not working. We're not growing. He's not stopping the boats. The boat numbers are the same as they were uh, two years ago. Government spending's going up. He hasn't got on top of the immigration plans. And I'm sorry to disagree with Esther, who you just had on there. She's not correct, actually, because the, the, uh, the legal immigration numbers, they're still going up. They talk about 300,000. That coming down, at best, that'll start in March. At best. So... Uh, you well, know, and, and it still does mean, as she did concede, it still does mean net migration of about 400,000, which I think many people would regard as being far too high, to be fair. But with respect to, to, to Rishi Sudak, he was saying that the boat numbers are down. But they're not uh, down. This month, they're yeah, exactly the same as two that, years ago. Your plan to bring them down is to turn the boats back. Absolutely, right? our plan. And, and he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't commit to leaving the ECHR. And the only way we'll stop the boats mm. is to pick them up safely and take them yeah, back to France. Will you which we're legal do that? Yes, will because we're actually... legally entitled what to do it. What if people die? People are dying tragically at the moment. The kind and compassionate thing to do is to pick people up and take them back. Remember, they're all picked up at the moment, Patrick, mm. by border force at the 12-mile point and brought to Dover. The only change is you turn back to France and take them there. And we know it works because it worked in Australia. Are you not a bit worried about the idea of this turn-the-boats-back policy? Someone dies in the channel and then people Patrick, say, it, blood it's... on your hands. The blood is on the hands of the lawyers and the politicians who haven't got the guts to do my policy, which is why five people, tragically, have already died this year. Thousands are dying in the med. You've got to have strong, courageous leadership, do what Australia did, and that will sort this problem. I'm the only one who's brave enough to talk about it. The only, the only other um, thing that he said that I think is, is massively relevant to you was about the Rwanda plan. It all ties in a little bit with what we were just talking about there. He's saying that he's adamant that it's going to work. You, you don't think the Rwanda plan... Look, would the work. whole thing's a nonsense. He's wasted hundreds of millions of pounds on this ridiculous... It's not a deterrent. We know it's not a deterrent because already, this year, 1,500 people have come across the Channel in probably the worst month of the year, and they're dying. And people are prepared to put their lives at risk so it's clearly not a deterrent. He's completely wrong, but he's got nothing else because he's not brave enough to do what the British people want him to do, which is to take people back to France. And it's only Reform UK that is courageous enough to do that policy. I mean, he, he, he did talk there, didn't he, a, a bit about, you know, the fact that he thinks that uh, the deal with the French is good enough or what's happened with the returns agreement with Albania and, and that's what's... I mean, he has had some success. Lovely, warm, waffly words, but where's the results? Nowhere. The same numbers are coming across, Patrick. And whether it's... And, and go back to the lawful numbers. They put in the policy when he was Chancellor two years ago that meant that the lawful numbers exploded to one and a quarter million a year, a city the size of Birmingham. They caused the problem they're now trying to correct. Belatedly, too late, the British people are furious and have had enough, mm. and that's why they're deserting them in droves. The, the, one of the questions... We're going to have to be quite tight here. One of the questions that really did fumble him a little bit was on the vaccine yes. issue. Now, that is an issue that's... It's that's, a huge that's issue. you a little bit because you were quite pro-vaccine, weren't you? Uh, abs I'm sorry. Uh, what I said was I was pro the choice. It's an individual choice. We were the first people to say you shouldn't be vaccinating young people or children, and here's the point. I commit, and I don't think any other party will, I commit we need an inquiry 
into the vaccine injuries, vaccine injuries. And that is my commitment here this evening for the first time to you. That will be in our contract with the people. There has to be an inquiry. You heard it from those gentlemen. I'm hearing it up and down the country. So there is a serious UK, issue. So, OK, let's just have this rise. So, Reform UK, if voted, will immediately have an inquest into the vaccine injured. I'm absolutely right. We need that and it needs to happen quickly and there needs to be proper interim payments made to those who have been injured. OK, now, Richard, you're going to stay with me because we've got a bombshell exit poll. That was a room full of 100 undecided voters there in the North East that Richie Sunak was addressing. We did a straw poll when they've left and the people's verdict is in. How many of those people, undecided voters, do you think Richie Sunak has managed to vote Conservative at the next election? When I come back, I will have those... I've seen them. They are quite surprising. I'll have those results for you. So make sure that you stay tuned. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Francis, just stop oil have in the past broken the law. I remember distinctly the uh, Dartford crossing. That ended up with two jailed, I believe, if I remember correctly. Is it ever justified in your view? Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I mean, I would, I would have to say yes. I mean, we're trying to preserve my life, your lives, the lives of your family. And it's not just the planet that we're trying to protect. It's the lives of, of millions of people. And, you know, we know from history that we have to break the law in order to, to put pressure on the government and to, to be listened to. No and one would doubt no your that. sincerity in your views. You genuinely believe in what you fight for. But there are others who think differently. For example, there are Islamist extremists who believe that people will go to hell unless they convert to Islam. They will sincerely, perhaps, break the law in order to force people to convert. In their view, they might be saving people's lives for eternity. There might be abortion activists who say that babies are being murdered and to save their lives, we need to break the law to stop people having abortions. Why do you get to say that your moral conviction is the one that's right and other people's individual moral conviction are those that are wrong? So what's really integral to the Just Stop Oil campaign is the fact that it is a non-violent campaign. That's what separates us from the examples that you've just given. We're absolutely dedicated non-violence, both as a tactic and as a principle. So though we might be breaking the law... If it... individuals take it upon themselves to break the law for whatever their course is, surely the way that we decide what society wants in general is democratic and within the law. Well, of course, we know also that protest is absolutely integral to maintaining and upholding a democracy, and in, in particular, non-violent protest. I mean, I really can't express to you how severe this situation is, and I'm sure you know this. It's 10pm. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. Even though we're not out of the woods yet, at the start of this year, I believe that we have made progress and that we're heading in the right direction. The bombshell exit poll is in. Did Prime Minister Rishi Sunak convince anyone to vote for him after our People's Forum performance? Also, a Labour by-election candidate makes a shocking Israel slur. Well, has the party now cleaned up its act or is this more devastating news for Labour? Asylum seekers have literally been getting baptised in their droves. Just have a look at that if you're watching us on telly. When will the church respond to the latest scandal? And anger as double child killer Colin Pitchfork could be set free again. I've got all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages tonight for you with Express columnist Carol Malone, journalist Mike Buckley and ex-Brexit party MEP Belinda DeLucy. Heck of a lot for them to go out tonight, isn't it? Oh, and one school trip got more than they bargained for in their luggage hold. Yeah, I'll be revealing all shortly. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. Massive hour coming your way. That bombshell exit poll is right around the corner and Richard Tyson from Reform UK is here to react to it. See you in a tick.
Patrick, thanks very much indeed, and good evening to you. The Prime Minister has defended the government's economic record during a live appearance on the GB News People's Forum tonight. Rishi Sunak told voters in North Yorkshire that the government's economic plan was starting to work. He answered unvetted questions on the economy, housing, education, tax and the NHS, and even the COVID-19 vaccine. The Prime Minister told the People's Forum all the UK's economic indicators were headed in the right direction. The plan is working. You can see that on the economy. You can see it in lower taxes. The alternative is going back to square one with the Labour Party. He can't tell you what he's going to do differently. He doesn't have a plan, and that means we won't get the change that our country deserves. That's the change that I want to deliver for all of you. And today in the House of Lords, the Prime Minister's safety of Rwanda bill was a subject of heated debate. It faced considerable opposition there, with a joint committee of MPs and peers saying the law was fundamentally incompatible with the UK's obligations on human rights. The House of Lords will be voting on a series of amendments designed to weaken the legislation to deport asylum seekers to the East African nation. Well, in breaking news tonight from the Labour Party, Labour has withdrawn its support for Rochdale by-election candidate Azhar Ali following criticism of remarks he made about Israel. Mr Ali had apologised after he was recorded at a meeting of the Lancashire Labour Party suggesting that Israel had taken the October 7th Hamas assault as a pretext to invade Gaza. Labour's been under pressure to expel him from the party after the remarks emerged. The Shadow Chancellor Pat McFadden says Labour his decision was tough but necessary. Nottinghamshire Police is being investigated over the force's contact with paranoid schizophrenic Valdo Calacane before he killed three people. The Independent Office for Police Conduct has launched a probe into police's former contact with Calacane, as well as their handling of the murder investigation itself. The 32-year-old killed two students and a caretaker last year in unprovoked attacks in Nottingham. The watchdog added allegations have also been made about the non-execution of an outstanding warrant for Calacane's arrest prior to the killings. And the Royal Navy aircraft carrier HMS Prince of Wales left Portsmouth Harbour today following a slight delay at the weekend. The £3 billion warship is now on her way to Norway to take part in the largest NATO exercise since the Cold War. Her commanding officer said his crew had managed to bring the ship from 30 days' notice to immediate readiness in just one week. She was put on standby a week ago after HMS Queen Elizabeth was forced to cancel her deployment because of a proposal issue. For the very latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, Rishi Sunak has just spoken to a group of 100 people undecided on how they're going to vote at the next general election. And they didn't hold back. Hi, Rishi Sunak. I've got so much to say about such little time. My name is John Watt, and I'm one of the COVID vaccine injured in this country. I want you to look into my eyes, Rishi Sunak, and I want you to look at the pain, the trauma, and the regret I have in my eyes. We have been left with no help at all. Not only am I in here that's vaccine injured, there's another man over there whose life's been ruined by that COVID-19 vaccine. Why are the people who are in charge, who told us all to do the right thing, have left us all to rot and left me and the thousands and the tens of thousands in this country. So look, there is a vaccine compensation scheme that's in place, as you alluded to in the NHS. Obviously, everyone individually will work through their cases. It's difficult for me to comment on anyone's individual case, I'm sure. Very powerful moment, that. Very powerful. And in the last hour, the Prime Minister has come under criticism for how he responded to that unfortunate vaccine victim. Here's one of the big headlines from that fantastic GB News People's Forum. The Prime Minister admitted that there was more progress still to be made on the NHS. It's hardly a shock, is it? But said that progress hinged on the trade unions. We saw that it started to fall because we didn't have strikes for a period at the end of last year. And that has been a real challenge, and I'll just be honest with you about that. But in November, first month, where we had absolutely no strikes in the NHS, do you know what? The waiting list fell by 100,000. Biggest one-month fall in the waiting list in well over a decade outside of COVID. So that gives me the confidence that our plans 
can work and will work. The industrial action is something we need to work through. So the strikes are at least partly to blame for our NHS waiting list misery says Sunak. I mean, he is right about that. The problem is that there were stonking great big waiting lists before the strikes as well. But the Prime Minister also hit out at Sir Keir Starmer and the Labour Party on the day that they finally dropped their by-election candidate for Rochdale as our rally after he was accused of peddling anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. The Labour Party hasn't changed. It's not change, it's a con, right? And that's what you have to remember. A vote for anyone who's not me, who's not your Conservative candidate, is a vote to put him with his values and his party in power. You saw it last week, what that would mean for the economy. Can't tell you how he's going to pay for £28 billion decarbonisation policy, which means higher taxes for you and everyone else. Stood by this person in Rochdale until the media pressure got too much. Like, that's the values. Has doing everything he can right now to frustrate the passage of our Rwanda bill in the House of Lords. Do you want any of that? Strong stuff there. He thinks Labour's a con. He was actually responding to a question about the threat of Reform UK. According to recent polls, they are stealing votes off the Conservatives at a rapid rate. Richard Sy, the leader of Reform UK, is sitting just over there from me now to react to our exit poll. But did Sunak's performance tonight tame any of that rebellion? As I said, tonight's audience were all undecided voters. And here are the results now of our exit poll. 50% of them said they will vote Conservative at the next election. 14% said they will vote for another party. There we go, 36% are still undecided. Keep that on the screen there, 50%. 50% said they'd vote Tory. 14% said they'd vote for another party. And 36% remained undecided. So, well, Rishi's claiming that as a victory, isn't he? I think fascinating numbers there. 50% of people in a room full of undecided listen to him and say they're going to vote for him. Let's get instant reaction. And it's the man himself. It's the leader of Reform UK, Richard Tice. Richard, not great for you, that. Is it 50% of them are going to vote for him? Oh, I don't know. It looks like it's a 50-50. It's a close tie, it seems to me, Patrick. It doesn't seem the Labour Party's anywhere. That's my response to that. Well, OK, well, presumably you were hoping that maybe fewer people would actually vote for him. 50% of people are undecided voters. You know, about 36% said that they were still on the fence. 14%, though, saying that they're going to vote for another party. If you split that vote between all of the other parties, I mean, it's very hard to say how many of them go reform. Are you still, are you still feeling strong about the polls? No, we're feeling... We're the only party that seems to be going up in the polls at the moment, Patrick. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, exit poll there. It does seem rather out of... Uh, out of kilter with the 20, 22 per cent that all of the other uh, average of polls is currently showing the Conservative Party. So time will tell. You know what polls are like. The one that counts, Patrick, is the one on, uh, on election day. OK, all right. And, and look, just on a couple of those key points, if people are just tuning in, that Richie Sunak was grilled in right now, and there's 36 per cent of people out of those 100 people in that room who were as yet and still are undecided about who to vote for. You know, he was making the point that you know, Rwanda is a good policy. He was making the point that you need to trust the Tories on the economy to, to get things right. And basically, if you vote for you, Richard, if they vote for reform, you get Keir Starmer. So, go on, respond to that. Yeah, look, we keep hearing about this. He's absolutely petrified. You can't be rewarded for 14 years of failure for breaking the country. I mean, everybody says nothing works. We're paying ever higher taxes, nothing works. And so people are saying, actually, We've got to look elsewhere, and that's why we're going up in the polls. It, it's quite clear. That's why he's so petrified about even mentioning our name, because all his advisers are saying, watch out for reform. And, you know, we're, we're going to see what happens over the next coming weeks and months. OK, all right. Look, Richard, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, holding on the other side of that for those exit poll results. Um, let's get the thoughts now, shall we? of my wonderful panel this evening. And I do have Daily Express columnist Carol Malone. I've got journalist and commentator Mike Buckley. And I also have the former Brexit Party MEP Belinda De Lucy. Carol, um, I'm going to start with you. And actually, I'd like to start by playing a little clip from, mm -hmm. from um, Sunak there. This clip has already had 400,000 views on our Twitter. And it is the clip of the vaccine-injured man. Um, just listen to how impassioned this guy was, and of course, Rishi's answer. Hi, Rishi Sunak. I've got so much to say, but such little time. My name is John Watt, and I'm one of the COVID vaccine injured in this country. 
I want you to look into my eyes, Rishi Sunak, and I want you to look at the pain, the trauma, and the regret I have in my eyes. We have been left with no help at all. OK, Carol, what did you make of that moment? Was Rishi rattled, do you think? He's, Rishi did try to say he was very sympathetic. I think he was rattled. He did say, as soon as the, the guy stopped on, that he was very sorry for his circumstances. There's not much else you can say. But, you know, I, I get why the guy's impassioned and upset, but, you know, we're forgetting the time. We're forgetting how it was at the time. You know, I think there are 30,000 vaccine injured. There were tens of thousands more people who died because when there was no vaccine. So I think we're forgetting the, the terror of the times, the fear of the times the hopelessness. Then when the vaccine came, a lot of people went for it. No one was forced to do it. Mm. Yes, he's the guy was quite right. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. He was, yeah. he, was, he was right when he said we were told to do the right thing. Not everybody did, but they made a choice. But, you know, we also have to remember that the vaccine was very new. It was rushed out. It, you know, did anyone expect it to be 100%? Probably not. But, you know, I feel for the guy, and I feel for... Because mm. now he should be taken care of now. The bottom line is it's been two years since almost the end of the pandemic. People like him should be taken care of and they should feel cared for. Okay. Well, we actually just had a policy announcement before uh, the end of this hour from Richard Tice, who said if reform get in, one of the first things they do is set up an inquiry into the vaccine injured. Now, Belinda, one thing that Richard can't get away from is that it is like a, a ball and chain around his neck, the fact that... He was very pro-vaccine at the time, OK? But we have just had this policy announcement here on Patrick Christie tonight that Reform UK will have that immediate inquiry. Is that the right thing? Should Rishi do the same? I think we should. I, I do differ with Carol. I do think um, there was far too much pressure put on people uh, who were not necessarily anywhere near any risk at all to have a vaccine that they didn't want, either to, to fulfil a work commitment, to travel, way too much pressure, and also a climate of ostracising those who chose mm. not to. Um, and I think that was, that was deeply unfair, and they used fear to try and push the vaccine on young... My daughters... I mean, I, I didn't want my children to have the vaccine, because they were not at risk. And I do think that there, there are questions around how much pressure and how people felt forced to have a vaccine that they didn't only not want but not necessarily need. I think it was good for old people and vulnerable people, but I do think there should be investigation how that climate of fear and pressure was, but was put on people. But you're talking in hindsight now, Belinda. I, I said it at the time, Carol. Yeah. I said it well, at the time. Well, maybe, but, there's a lot, but a lot of people are talking in hindsight now about now because of what we know at the time. There was national panic. Do you no, know I, I wasn't. I, no, national I tweeted panic. many, many times times about there being far too much pressure but, put on those not But we didn't know enough, risk. that's the point. No one knew enough, not even the government. All right, I, I just want to move it on slightly now. Um, we've got another clip, and I'll go to you on this first, Mike, but we've got another clip now, the Prime Minister's response to a question about the issue of trans. I really don't think anything I just said, quite frankly, should be controversial. Are we respectful and tolerant of people and their differences, it's particularly when they're going through things that are sensitive? Yes, of course we are. Do we think it, biological sex was important when we're thinking about women's safety, women's health? Yes, of course, I think most people would think that is important. And in particular, I think these things are important when we're considering our children, which is why we've recently published guidance for schools about how to deal with these issues in our classrooms. Mike, this is one area where the Tories do absolutely beat Labour hands down, isn't it, being able to tell you what a woman is? Labour knows exactly what a woman is, as does Keir Starmer. I mean, I think sometimes you have these moments... It's not true, Mike. It just won't sometimes, say. Sometimes, sorry. Sometimes sorry. you have these moments when you learn something about who somebody is. And I think last week, when Rishi Sunak was attacking Keir Starmer over his uh, policy on this and his views on this, when Brianna Gay's... Um, uh, I might be mispronouncing the surname there, sorry. Right. Jai, yeah. Jai, sorry, yeah. Brianna Jai's uh, mother was sat in the um, gallery in the House of Commons... And, and obviously this is a woman who's just lost her teenager um, to a brutal murder. And that's, you know, just been decided and so on. Um, the inhumanity of it, oh, I just nonsense. find, is mm. absolutely staggering. People and I, in I think your the vast own party have said that was country, distorted. You're distorting the fact. I'm not people distorting in your own anything. Party have this said... woman has lost her child. St she what? was sat in the gallery. Yeah, yeah, and the, Richie and Sunak Parliament knew that. Place, and he still attacks Parliament that community. Is a place for now, business. whatever you think about the trans community, that was completely unconscionable. Starmer attacked Rishi first about his I think a lot of people would have made up their mind about Rishi Sunak in that moment, thinking that he's going to attack the mother of a murdered teenager. 
Starmer, yeah, I would say, that 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 I would say you, Starmer you, used that, that, mm. that poor lady. No, he didn't. He, he, yeah, he, he completely used her. Mike, can I ask you a quick question? If someone, say, uh, uh, a Muslim was violently attacked because he was Muslim and that's a hate crime, does that mean we all have to start believing in Islam? My point is, when anyone is attacked, if it is a trans hate crime, that doesn't mean we have to suddenly start following trans ideology. We have to keep Parliament free of any pressure in the gallery mm -hmm. to not speak out about fundamental issues like defending and protecting women's single-sex spaces, which have been under relentless attack from trans okay. activists. And you can right. still agree that the horrific right. murder of Brianna was absolutely, you know, emotionally then. horrible. But oh. Parliament has to be free of the pressure is, to attack women, which there is... There is a time and a no, place not, to debate... No, no, Parliament has to be free of the trans That's where they were, and Parliament. The needs for, to keep women safe. The I absolutely agree that is a debate that's So trans, worth trans needs are to attack women's single-sex spaces, because that's what's been happening. That is not the case in the it's, society. It's exactly... Look at the but sports. The time look at when prisons. This, you're putting this, rapists this in prison. This young woman was murdered. Her mother was sat in the gallery. That is not the time to have that debate. There are other times and other Starmer opportunities to have that debate. started the debate. And indeed, Sunak was not even having that debate. He was just using an attack on Keir Starmer because he thought it would get him to vote. Parliament has to be course, free of pressure from the gallery. It has to be free. I want to get in. I want to get in. That's another point. Humane, another point of massive disagreement, okay, which is the <laughs> NHS. All right, which is the NHS. Um, look, let's just hear again from Rishi Sunak, and then we'll have it out. We saw that it started to fall because we didn't have strikes for a period at the end of last year. And that has been a real challenge, and I'll just be honest with you about that. But in November, first month, where we had absolutely no strikes in the NHS, do you know what? The waiting list fell by 100,000. Biggest one-month fall in the waiting list in well over a decade outside of COVID. So that gives me the confidence that our plans can work and will work. The industrial action is something we need to work through. Right, so, Carol, striking workers in the NHS, are they to blame for the waiting lists? Um, I think they're to blame for the, um, the inflation of waiting lists in recent months, yes. But rather than have a go at them, I would rather him talked about the advances that have been made, the fact that since 2010, we have 47,000 more doctors, we have 60,000 more nurses, because we're forever hearing from Labour that there's not enough of them. We have there billions are more people in the country. There, are, there are lots of... Yeah, but still, 40,000 new doctors is quite a lot and 60,000 nurses. Yeah. But, I mean, I think he was completely right to say what he said about... Of course, it, it, it equals... If you have all your doctors and your nurses on strike, yes, the waiting lists are going over. If only a well, fool would think they wouldn't. This is the Tories' line now, clearly, Mike, in going into the next election, which is, if your junior doctors got to get back to work and get off the picket lines, uh, we'd have slammed through these waiting lists. Well, Rishi Sulak, rather amusingly, admitted himself they haven't brought the waiting list down in over a decade, which is a record of utter failure from this government. The, the rating is to not high because we've had strikes recently. Bear in mind, most of these people have had a 25% pay cut since 2010. The big yeah, rise in the waiting list was between 2010 and 2019, before the pandemic. It hasn't come down since then, granted, but the big rise was due to underfunding and under-resourcing from this government. Originally, Senate talks about going back to square one with Labour. Well, if by that he means record low waiting lists in 2010, okay. a do record high satisfaction in the NHS, a lot of people would be perfectly pay, happy to go back to You say they've had a 25% pay cut. Do you know what the average pay for a third-year doctor is? Do you have any any idea? Off the top of my head, no, I don't. Of course don't. you don't, because you just, you just well, talk... what is it? It's 65 grand, which I don't think means they're on the very But it's still side. been second, massively cut since 2010. doctor gets 45 grand. No, no, that's the but figures... But junior doctors are earning less than it. people are only working you in Presse Do you know what's you know interesting? Do you know what's interesting? No one is ever held to account in the NHS, ever. It's no. got enough money. Don't take one single no, penny is, more from the taxpayer. It's got its wastage, 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 and no-one's held account. That needs to be changed in the NHS. People have got long-term health problems. Lefties keep striking. We just found yes. out today right. that 1.5 million people in the last year are waiting over 12 hours in A&E. Which is awful. Is it's so, yeah, off. so that's management. You're saying there, well, you're nothing about no, it. No, I'm saying Why it's... Why don't we do something about yeah, it? Yeah, let's stop so the we'll strikes, the election, mismanage... They will do something let's about it. Let's wait and no. see, yeah. Oh, my right. gosh. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Oh. Now, coming up... Another really contentious point. The Rochdale by-election candidate, Azar Ali, has been dropped by Labour on the ballot. I mean, this is an absolute hot mess, to be fair. Not just there for Labour, but they are, they are really struggling with this at the moment. It's that Israel-Gaza issue, isn't it? My panel will react to that if they're not killed each other in the break. And we've got tomorrow's newspaper front pages. But first, 
More on the pray to stay scandal. I am not letting this go here on Patrick Christie tonight. A Bangladeshi man converted to Christianity to avoid being deported after serving 12 years in prison for murdering his wife. So why are the church and the court putting the UK in danger? And is Grand Shaps right that the woke mind virus has now infected our armed forces? Who better to discuss this with than Fleet Street legend Kelvin McKenzie? He's riled up and ready to go. I'll see you in a sec. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. Welcome to the show. Superb stuff, great footage. So you're right in the thick of it there. What's the mood on the ground? Well, I've left there now. I've actually now come to that EU Council summit that I was talking about. Um, it's still pretty chaotic. The entire city of Brussels has been completely clogged with these tractors, sort of three abreast in most of the roads across the city. The people of Brussels aren't particularly happy. I mean, this is sort of reminiscent for some people of the Just Stop Oil protests, you know, people gluing themselves, people are unable to get to hospital appointments. And there's a lot of upset about the destruction that's happening on the streets of Brussels today. But on the other side, there's also the protests, which the farmers are saying that EU green laws simply are not able uh, to bit with what they need to do to keep their businesses going. And just before the protests happened, we saw the European Commission actually make some concessions to the farmers' protests. And this is on the, the demands that were put on them to set aside somewhere in the region of 5% of their land for regrowing for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. A lot of the farmers have said that's not possible. And the European Commission has said that they can delay that coming in. So they have won a small concession with these protests. And Jack, there's a feeling as well, a huge dissatisfaction that the European Union has managed to find 50 billion euros in aid to send to Ukraine. And yet farmers in particular are on the, on the receiving end of net zero targets, taxation on diesel and endless red tape. So many farmers, Jack, saying they're measuring ditches to see if they have to drain them or not. There are minimum requirements on the width of battery hen um, enclosures. Endless Endless red tape, as Jeremy Clarkson pointed out in Clarkson's form in Britain. They've simply had enough and they're shouting, Ursula von der Leyen, we are here. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. We're on GB News. Now, tomorrow's newspapers are flying in thick and fast, so I'll give you a heads up on those very, very shortly. Um, but uh, details are emerging of the horrifying number of foreign criminals claiming to be Christian in order to escape deportation. Indeed, a Bangladeshi man who served 12 years behind bars for murdering his wife successfully appealed against the Home Office's attempts to deport him because he claimed he was a Christian. A judge ruled that he would be at risk in his predominantly Muslim country in Bangladesh. I'm not quite sure why, but there we go. It comes just days after a church minister revealed that he's baptised hundreds of asylum seekers in the sea in South Wales. And if you're watching us on TV or online, there's a clip of it there. Only for half of them to completely disappear. 
immediately afterwards. Well, who could have... Who would have bet a tenner on that, eh? Speaking last week, a spokesperson for the Church of England said the Abdulazidi case, this is the um, uh, Clapham acid attack, alleged. Abdulazidi case is clearly a shocking and distressing incident. Our thoughts and prayers are with all of those affected by it. As we've said, it is the role of the Home Office and not the Church to vet asylum seekers. However, Kelvin McKenzie joins me now, uh, former editor of The Sun. Um, well, it's becoming increasingly, I think, actually the Church of England's fault, isn't it? I mean, if they're baptising all of these people, they are part and parcel of this, and we've got situations where a Bangladeshi bloke who's murdered his wife still can't be deported. Why? Well, because he's now a Christian, which he's obviously right. not. Right. So he's not a Christian, and even if he were a Christian, he has murdered his wife. He is Bangladeshi. I honestly don't care what happens to him back in his homeland, mm. right? The man's a killer. Yep. Why, why should it be our responsibility to, to nurture him and find him work or, or, or do whatever it is for it? This is a problem for his own country. And it, it's, a, it's his own country whose job it is to defend him. If there are, unless they are a nation yep. where, uh, if they are a Muslim nation, where actually they think it's quite a good thing for Christians to be taken apart. And there are, of course, countries within the Middle East in which that view is very much predominant. So it's an absolute disgrace, this. Mm. The Church of England's role in all this, and not only the Church of England, other churches as yes, well, true. Baptist churches and the like, right, uh, uh, which is the one connected with Zidi, right, or know they have a role, and they have chosen to say, we are all God's people. And then when this goes wrong, then they say, oh, it's the Home Office. I'm afraid they are led by the Archbishop of Canterbury who stands up constantly and says, boat people, come on over. And on that basis, if they want preferment within the Church of England, then the way to get it is obviously to baptise people. Should victims of asylum seekers who've converted to Christianity and then gone on to commit crimes and where they've used their conversion to Christianity as the basis to stay in the country be able to sue Justin Welby? Well, that is a very good idea, and I think they should definitely... Well, the, the real question is, the real question is, why does the church, whoever it is, whether it's this pastor, by the way, who shows... He, he's basically in favour of doing this, why do they think it's a good idea to be duped in this way? They know full well that these people are not Christians, right? So why do they do it? Mm. What is in it for them? Mm. Is there some donation to the church being made? Does it make them feel better personally? These questions have to be answered. And I would be grateful if somebody would pass a law which basically said mm. you have to actually face some strict... I mean, there was one judge pointed out to another judge that actually how on earth could that person be, con uh, be converted when, in fact, he'd only been in the country five weeks and hadn't mentioned it on his arrival? Yeah. So in five weeks, he went from Islam to the good well, Lord. And the conveyor belt is being exposed. So what we have now, and this is according to testimony of people within the church, was uh, Muslim men at the back of the church with wads of cash in their pocket, a ready army of people waiting to be baptised, then photographs going immediately on Facebook, and then, shock horror, hours later, phone calls from immigration lawyers asking that vicar or that priest or whoever to go on record and vouch for that person being a Christian. Now, so, so you conveyor belt, right? So the conveyor belt is it led by the is it led by well, lefty core, lawyers? As the core, it's the, it's the lawyers, but it's everyone involved, isn't it? Isn't it? But at the core, it's the lawyers who then put pressure on a you know a village priest or whatever to say, oh, do you know this person's going to get lynched if they go back to their country? How can you have that on their conscience? But Welby's got to stand up about this. Yes, but he doesn't want to, does he? Mm. He doesn't want to, and I probably... And, and probably it is probably the end of the Welbys running the Church of England. We need... We, surely... No wonder, no wonder nobody goes to, to Church of England churches. What, why would they go there? Nobody believes in anything except bringing lots of people illegally, essentially. It's quite well, wrong. The, the irony will be, obviously, if it all comes out, which it appears to be coming out, that the church has been complicit in helping a load of people who aren't Christian lie about being Christian to then stay in the country and reduce the number of people actually going to churches. I mean, they talk about self-defeating. I've got one more for you, though, because... Um. because uh, Grant Shapps, our Defence Secretary, has hit out at the woke and extremist culture infiltrating the army after he was forced to hold crisis talks with army bosses over plans to relax security checks to increase diversity. So, Kelvin, we've got a threat of Russia, we've got uh, the turmoil in the Middle East, and apparently, apparently, we are now saying that diversity matters more than national defence. Yes, it, it, it's madness, 
and we haven't got enough. We haven't got enough soldiers. By the way, we had two aircraft carriers which should have been heading out to a massive NATO, uh, the biggest NATO uh, get together since the Cold War, and neither of them could leave Portsmouth Harbour because they were both. They both weren't working. One of them has now limped out. God knows what's going to happen when the first when the first missiles fired. But th there are significant issues within our military. Surely we have to believe that we are not going to face an issue where a say a major says to a subaltern, uh, "I'd like you to go over that hill," mm. and the guy turns around and says, "I tell you what, I've been thinking about that hill. That hill looks a bit." Looks a bit large for me. Do you mind going over there and having a look first? I mean, once we get into all that, which of course is what happens within employment. When you employ people, you have to bend over backwards to make sure that they're going to do what you hope they're going to do. And if you start getting that in the middle of a war, then I'm afraid uh, I, uh, the outcome in Ukraine would be quite clear against a really vile enemy. And we, are, we face a significant issue going forward. We have to be, unfortunately, strong. And I don't like using the word woke, but everybody has to be on the same page on this. Yeah. Yeah, we, we realistically have played fast and loose with a lot of institutions when it comes to putting diversity, inclusion and equality at the top of the agenda, as opposed to saying, what is your actual job and what function needs to be served here? I think the military is one area where uh, absolutely that cannot happen, but it has happened. Right, and it can't happen in the police force either, can it? That's true. That, that, well, it shouldn't really be happening anywhere, should it? Yeah. I mean, healthcare, I mean, actually, the more you think about it, the more it shouldn't really be happening anywhere, to be fair. But, uh, Kelvin, thank you very much. I have been speaking to an MOD spokesperson who said this, our priority is protecting the national security of the United Kingdom and ensuring the operational effectiveness of our armed forces. We take security extremely seriously. You bloody hope so, would you, the Ministry of Defence? Take security extremely seriously and ensure that all personnel have the appropriate security clearance, which is reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ministry of Defence. Coming up, forget the small boats crisis. Kids in Southampton have been dealing with their own school coach crisis as they discovered suspected migrants hiding in the luggage hold of their bus that had been ferried back from France. Good grief, can you imagine? Also, by the way, one of those migrants did something incredibly naughty in a girl's school case, but I will tell you all about that later. More details on that next, and I will bring you all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages today. Plus, we have the latest on Labour dropping the Rochdale by-election candidate, Azhar Ali. This is massive for the Labour Party. We've been calling the shots on this early doors here on Patrick Christie's Tonight. Labour has a massive problem when it comes to Palestine. More on this shortly. It's Patrick Christie's Tonight. We're only on GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. Marnie says being sexy in business is entirely possible and maybe even better. Well, Marnie, this is something I would say is true. I've had to live with this for quite a long time, <laughs> and uh, I think you can. I think you can do both. Now, tell me, it's lovely to see you first of all. Thank you for having me. In all your gorgeousness. <laughs> Um, and you're telling me that that often is regarded as something derogatory or something to hold you back. Is that right? It's just this really unfair thing, this really unfair narrative that women can't do both. Even men can do it. As you know, Eamon, you can do it, you wow. can do it all. Um, and I just think, you know, women are so multifaceted. They can be mothers, they can be sexy, they can be businesswomen, they can be silly, they can be all these different dimensions. And this, this press push that we have to yes. limit ourselves to one category, yeah. it's just unfair. But do you think I think that is where some people may be wrong-footed or go wrong to underestimate you. Exactly. There is that saying, disarm with charm. So, oh. you know, that there is that, that idea that people do look at someone who cares about how they look, who's perhaps a bit feminine, uh, and underestimate them. But hopefully I've proved that wasn't the case in the boardroom. And thank goodness for Karen Brady. She's definitely up the glam stakes on the show. And if anybody can prove that you can be sexy and successful in business, I suppose it's her, really. But where do you think most of the criticism comes from? Because I have to say, hard to believe, but when I was younger, I certainly got a bit of this at my old employer, being told that I had to dress a certain way, not to be too sexy, which I found hugely... I'm you were offensive. told this by women. I was told this by a female boss who didn't like me wearing zips on the back of my dress. Not just me, but some of the other presenters yeah. there. And I took such offence. I felt like she thought that I was some sort of 
I don't know what. Um, yeah. do, do you take offence when people are criticising you that, you know, in some way they think you're, I don't know. There's just no right answer. And as we said, I think Karen Brady is doing an excellent job at leading the charge that you can be glamorous and get the job done. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's Punch and Christie tonight, only on GB News, and I have just been handed tomorrow's front pages for you. So, shall we do it? Let's go in with the Metro. Playing field ideology, schools contract scandal exposed. So, £30,000 grass cutting cost, even in winter, means head skimps on staff. OK, all right, well, we'll probably have to read a bit more inside to realise why the hell that's on the front page. But anyway, The Sun. Corrie Ken's £550,000 tax bill. Coronation Street star Bill Roach owes the taxman nearly £550,000. His debt is revealed in court papers by The Sun. Uh, there's also some stuff about Beyonce and Taylor Swift. Why not? The Daily Mail. Keir is forced to act Israel slur candidate, and this is, for me, the story, anyway, after the Mail reveals that the would-be MP attacked, quote, Jews in the media. Look, he's banging on about how Labour is a change party. Meanwhile, you've got Azir Ali claiming that Israel deliberately allowed the Hamas October the 7th massacre of its own people, and much more. Again, unrelated, Taylor Swift on the front cover. What's the obsession? The Guardian. Labour cuts ties with Rochdale candidate over Israel. Comments. Party activists told to stop campaigning for Azhar Ali. Also a picture there of Israeli hostages, I believe, being released after uh, a new Israel offensive in Rafa. OK, all right, look, so heck of a lot for us to go out there. Uh, here with me on my show tonight, I've got my wonderful panel, my press pack, is Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, who's laughing at something. <laughs> I've got journalist and commentator Mike Buckley and former Brexit Party MEP Belinda DeLucy. Uh, breaking news tonight is that Labour has officially withdrawn its candidate from the Rochdale by-election, Azhar Ali. He's apologised for remarks that he made about Israel in a community meeting. It's a secret recording obtained by the Mail on Sunday. Ali said uh, that Israel had allowed the deadly attack by Hamas gunmen on October the 7th. He's now retracted his remarks, saying he apologises unreservedly to the Jewish community for my comments, which were deeply offensive, ignorant and false. He says that Hamas's horrific terror attack was the responsibility of Hamas alone and they're still holding hostages who must be released. Um, but yesterday, Labour's national campaign coordinator, Pat McFadden, said that Mr Ali would remain their Rochdale candidate, but he's now officially been dumped by the party. It's flip-flop central, isn't it? Labour can't field a new replacement. Oh, McFadden's piped up again. The fact that you've got the very rare circumstance where a political party is uh, withdrawing support from a candidate after nominations have closed so that he can't be replaced as the Labour candidate shows that Keir Starmer takes his statements about changing the Labour Party, takes his statements about rooting anti-Semitism out of the Labour Party extremely seriously, and even though this was a tough decision to take, he took it, and in doing so, knows he did the right thing. You stood by him, mate. Carol. That's absolute tush, what he just said there. Starmer did not do the right thing. He was forced into doing the right thing after, after there was a clamour all day today from everywhere saying, you've got to get rid of this guy. The guy, this guy, Ali, only apologised profusely because he was found out. He didn't before. <clears throat> And for Starmer to keep telling us he's got he's got the grips on anti-Semitism, that's tosh as well. You know, we had just a month ago Kate Osmore. Last year we had Diane Abbott. The year before that we had Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, all of these people suspended. The year before that, Chris Williamson. Anti-Semitism is bubbling under the surface of the Labour Party, and Starmer's nowhere near got it under control. And the fact that he's taken a full day to actually withdraw support from this guy is shocking. And it just shows he cares more about political expediency than he does about his, his, his principles, because the only reason he didn't 
attack the guy this morning was oh. because he knows that, that he's got Muslim support and a lot of up-and-coming yeah. election, yeah. by-elections. He doesn't want All to right. upset them. Well, you're, you're banging trouble there, Mike, with Labour Party. I mean, Keir's been absolutely clear and categoric on rooting out anti-Semitism in the Labour Party since he became leader. And the evidence of that is that he's re re rebuilt very strong links with the Jewish community. Uh, as evidence a couple of weeks ago, there was a big Jewish Labour movement, which is the Jewish grouping in the Labour Party conference, about 600 people there, including, a sen including senior figures from the Jewish community, including Keir Starmer himself. So that's something that he's done incredibly successfully. No, he has The, fact the that Jewish he is... community don't trust if the you Labour let me Party. Finish, no, I'm not going to let you finish. That's rubbish. OK, but fine. I, you just I, carry on well, there. Well, I will carry on. You, you're saying that the Jewish people are, are support him. No, they don't. Half, most of the Jewish well, people want to vote Labour this election. Amount of evidence that's right. that. I mean, he's been genuinely very There's successful in rebuilding right. those links. The fact that he's now removed support from this gentleman is absolutely the right thing to do. Apparently, there have been new statements that he's made that have come to light, which is why the decision has been made to well, remove support now, yeah. whereas initially they had accepted his apology, but obviously that's that's no longer acceptable. So oh, it's unfortunate, well, but we've ended in the right that's the point. Go on, Belinda. Uh, right, just on. quickly, imagine if an MP candidate had said after the horrific Manchester attacks, uh, it wasn't done by an Islamist terrorist, it was done by the British government, all those innocent people yeah. slaughtered. They wouldn't have stood a chance. They would have been been banished, thrown out at that very instant. Keir didn't need any extra statements. On that statement alone, he should have been dropped straight away. And it wasn't just the, the horror of what he was saying. The worrying thing is, <laughs> is he saw a profitability in saying it to that community. Exactly. That is what is terrifying. And what will be interesting now is to see whether George Galloway or he indeed... The, Galloway yeah, will who, who on his campaign yeah. pamphlet, I believe, mm. you know, says he's standing Belinda, for Palestine. I think, you make a, I think you make a really good point. A really good point, which is that the problem is that those kind of views clearly appeal to an ever-increasing number of the British electorate. And that is something that we've been saying on this programme for a, a good while now, is, I think, only going to increase. Uh, here are all of the candidates standing in the Ultra Rochdale by-election. We've got, as, uh, as are Ali, easy for me to say, who is now an independent, uh, Mark Coleman, independent, Simon Danchuk, Reform UK, Ian Donaldson, Liberal Democrats, Paul Ellison, who's a Conservative, George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain, Michael Howarth, Independent, William Howarth, Independent, uh, Guy Otten, Green Party, and <laughs> Raven <laughs> Rodent Subortna of the official Monster Raving Looney Party, might and David Tully, Independent. Sounds a bit like the shipping forecast, that one. I'm reading it out, doesn't it? But those are all of your candidates. Uh, we still have more to get through here. I've got more front pages for you. Coming up, the British Horse Racing Authority has been slammed for allowing under-fire Tory peer Michelle Moan to run a horse in April's Grand National, despite her multi-million pound PPE round with the government. So should she be allowed to run her nag? Find out when I crown Greatest Britain and Union Jackass shortly. But, and I'm looking forward to talking about this with my panel, anger as double child rapist and killer Colin Pitchfork could be free from prison again. And I've just been seeing a story here, which is Suella Braverman, former home sex, saying stop making people feel guilty for being white. Stay tuned. See you in a tick. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. When you listen to Nigel Farage's assessment there, do you feel that maybe this is as good as it was going to get, given that we had the pandemic and it was inevitably always going to be a bit of a mixed bag? Well, I think it's a bit of a poor excuse from Nigel there that uh, they haven't done it properly. The facts are, Nigel, that it's not worked. It's not going to work. Yes, we will rejoin. I mean, are we better off for it? Are the, are the... Can I jump in there, Charlie? We're going to rejoin under which government? Because Labour aren't going to do that, unless you don't think... Well, but, but, I mean, it's going to be unavoidable not to join, because I think it's getting worse and worse for us. I mean, let me just say this. Are the NHS better because we're out of Europe? No, they're not, because they're not employing more staff. Is the building trade better off? No. Is travelling abroad or to the EU or staying in the EU, are we better off? No. Are we better off because foods rise because of the EU? No. Are we better off with imports and export? No, because they're taking longer. The overall result is that we're not better off. The killer point here is 57% of the public will now vote to remain. 33% would leave. Surely that's the telling yeah, point. It depends on the poster, Charlie, because we were talking to a very good poster earlier who said there's no enthusiasm for any change in a year. Maybe 10 years, they might be thinking about it. Belinda De Lucia, let's yeah. bring you in. I'm sure you want to react to what Charlie said. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought that the UK wanting to run its own affairs and 
making our politicians more accountable would be so revolutionary. The EU Parliament voted a majority to get rid of the vetoes, the last remaining scraps of democracy that the EU had. Now, luckily uh, for, for EU citizens at the moment, you know, it means an, a treaty change to actually go forward. But that, that is the mood. The ever closer union, we have dodged a federalised globalist, international, power-gobbling, anti-democratic organization. And that's worth more than a few trade and travel perks with, for a few wealthy people in this country. Hear, hear. Belinda DeLucy, <laughs> Charlie Mullins, great to see you both. More front pages for you now. Let's do it. We go in with the Times. Uh, we'll build more homes in the right places, vows the Prime Minister. He says he'll put rocket boosters under the construction industry. All right. Hours after backing him, Labour cuts ties with the candidate in Gaza Row. That's the Rochdale by-election. We've spoken about that. The Telegraph. Braverman. Don't make people feel guilty for being white. Former Home Secretary says it's dangerous and wrong to call the countryside racist. Look, I tell you what... I will start with this with my panel and then I'll move on to Colin Pitchfork because that guy will be out on the streets again. Um, go on, Belinda. Is Suella Braverman right to say that we, white people shouldn't feel guilty for being white? Abs absolutely. I do think there um, is a sort of force to try and demoralise and even dehumanise white people uh, to be responsible for all the sins in the world. You know, we're responsible for all the slavery, all the wars, everything ever that went wrong. It's, it's all down to, to people with this colour of skin. And it's just, it's a horrific lie and it's a terrible narrative. And, you know, no one should feel guilty alive today mm. uh, about the slave trade, about the British Empire. Um, and so I do think it's right to stand up to anti-white racism at all times. Mike, do you feel guilty for being white? No, I don't. But, I mean, this is quite an odd um, story, to be quite honest with you. I mean, it is true, of course, that racism is still a big problem in our society and it needs to be challenged in, in every possible way. However, apparently some... Um, for some reason, some countryside charities have yes. said that the countryside is a racist place and, you know, people of ethnic minority don't feel comfortable going there. I mean, all I'm going to say in response is read you this quote from Nihal Arthanayake, who was a BBC mm. uh, presenter, obviously, from ethnic minority. And he says, to brand the entirety of Britain as being racist and colonial does not help encourage people from ethnic minorities mm. to go into the countryside, which is a perfectly reasonable point. So why are these charities have made these statements, I don't know, because I've not read the backstory yeah. on yeah. it. But I think it's perfectly reasonable just to kind of query right. whether it was a good thing that they did. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, the demographics of uh, rural areas is, is something like 94%. Why? Well, there's a reason. It doesn't mean people but, are racist, but, though, but does it? No, exactly. That's, that's, right. yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's just, I mean, exactly. I actually, just in Britain. I actually agree with what Mike just said there. Um, uh, you know, I know, I know. I've, I've felt the same way. Um, <laughs> how, but the reason that there are so few people of colour living in the countryside is because when people come to this country, first of all, if they come from a different country, they don't go into the countryside because there's no work. They go to where the work is. They go to the cities. Mm. And that's a fact. When I grew up in Newcastle... Mm just outside, yeah. I, I didn't see a black person or a brown person because they didn't come that far north. It's That's a fact. It's changed now because, because everyone yeah. of colour is, <laughs> is together. However, but that's the reason, because there's not a lot of work. Well, not a lot of teenagers go to the countryside, course, not a lot of... And London, you try being a Londoner going into well, Devon, well, you know, it's to, not to all fair, about well, colour. To be fair, where I think the whole racist countryside thing falls apart, I used to live in the Lake District, uh, and, I mean, it's absolutely full of Japanese tourists. Of course <laughs> it is. You've got a really? massive obsession with Beatrix Potter. Yeah. Yes. She's and she's, she's, she's uh, yeah. It's, it's not that. It's just it's just a question of people going. But anyway, right. And um, they should take responsibility for not going. If they're choosing not to go. That's on them. Yes. Okay. Um, we do have this Colin Pitchfork discussion, which is going to have to be quite quick with now. So this is a double child rapist and killer. Colin Pitchfork is essentially up for parole again. Carol, should it's incredible. Been... He was he was put up for parole in December, and he was he was thought at that point this was like a month and a half ago not to be fit for a release. They're now re looking at it again. That this guy murdered two people. He's a child rapist and he's a double murderer. And the parents of of those kids are just beside themselves. So this guy is not fit to be led mm. back into society. He should be in jail for the rest of his life. I mean, he was let out, Mike, and then recalled uh, from memory because he. Um, got too close to some other kids. He started chasing girls or women yeah. again. So, I mean, obviously, they took him back in. I mean, it, it seems that this is almost... I mean, I can't imagine that they're going to let him out again. Surely not. This is just them following procedure. So, apparently, there's a testimony that they should have taken into account at the last hearing and they didn't, which means they have to go back and do it again. But it is almost... I mean, I cannot conceive of them letting out, given what happened last time. Very quickly. Child rapists, child murderers should be in a 
put a hole in the ground with a bread roll thrown at them maybe once a day if they're lucky, uh, <laughs> maybe a glass of water every two weeks. Right. Let's see how they do. Listening to the screams of their victims 24-7. Forget jail, put them in a hole. What's well, the former <laughs> Justice Secretary <laughs> there? <laughs> Lucy, uh, giving it large. All right, OK. Um, look, now, it seems like it's just uh, the beaches of Kent that illegal migrants are choosing to make their way into Britain on, but it's not, because school kids in Southampton were left stunned when discovering two suspected illegal migrants hiding under bags in the luggage compartment of their coach after returning from a school trip to France. So they opened the door. Oh, there he is. Uh, one of the men inside declared, excusez-moi, <laughs> before trying to run off, but was stopped by parents waiting to pick their children up. Uh, and one child's luggage was left covered in urine as well. Yeah. So there we go. It's a nice little present for everybody. So uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, the Home Office is not telling us where these are now, though, these chaps. But right, it's time now to reveal today's greatest Britain and Union jackass. Greatest Britain, Carol. Mine is Defence Secretary Grand Shops, which is amazing because I don't like him much, but he's pledging to end the poisonous, woke and extremist culture that has taken over our military. He's talking about, you know, we need a fighting force. We do, it doesn't matter what colour anyone is. It doesn't matter about ethnicity, what gender. You just need the best people for the job, and he's quite right. He's quite right, but, you know, we've had 14 years. Anyway, go on, Mark. What? what? They've had 14 years to not let this happen. And it's oh, I'm happened, sorry, the yeah. woke thing has only just oh. jumped up. All the diversity of us. And the other thing they did as well was they said for uh, Remembrance Sunday. We have to make it less yeah. Christian. Nonsense. All right, go on, my greatest Breton, please. So, mine is a chap called Professor Jan Fen Feng. I hope he's from pronouncing his uh, name correctly. He's from Warwick University. He is developing a test, an early blood test, to uh, detect dementia, which could help save lives and help prevent disease. So, this is a good thing. Very, this is a very nice thing. OK, go on, uh, My greatest <laughs> Brit is a uh, British actor, uh, Ralph Fiennes, uh, for speaking publicly against trigger warnings for theatre productions. And, and this is amazing, cos actors who speak out against wokery and snowflakery are as rare as hen's teeth. So well done for him. He said audiences should be shocked and should be disturbed. That's the whole point of a many, many a play. We've got a clip. <laughs> I think the impact of theatre should be that you're shocked and you should be disturbed. I don't think you should be prepared for these things. And when I was young, I never, we never had trigger warnings and for shows. So I would you get rid of them then? I, I would, yes, I would. Well, hey, very strong contenders today. Grant Chaps is today's greatest Britain uh, for trying to basically put national security over diversity. Um, right, we've just about got time for Union Jackass, Carol. Bank of England, eight years after the referendum results, still asking <laughs> on, a, on a monthly questionnaire what business if they're having problems with the referendum. Not asking about Ukraine or COVID or anything else, but that. But also, uh, I've been saying for myself, the Governor of Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, if he wants to, he should be sacked. If he really wants to know why businesses are damaged, how about soaring inflation and soaring? interest rates. That's probably The why. Bank of England has a, a, genuinely has a heck of a lot to answer for, actually. Yeah, they um, really do. Mike, who's your union jackass? No, I mean, well, we'll not talk about that issue. So, mine is the <laughs> British Horse Racing Authority, um, because Michelle Moan in the House of Lords famously owes us, owes the country, £122 million for selling dodgy PPE. They're going to let her race her horse in the Grand National anyway, and she might win and get loads more cash. Uh, yeah, all right. Oh, what? I mean, what's, it's not the horse's fault, Mike. It's fair. the British Horse Racing Authority's <laughs> all right. fault. All right. Yeah, it's okay. not the horse. I'm not <laughs> against the horse. I'll blame the horse. Um, OK, go on, Blendy, okay. your jackass. Uh, yeah, my jackass is a comedian called Paul Curry, who apparently after his show um, brought a Palestinian flag onto the stage and got the audience to stand up. And when um, a group of men didn't stand up, he asked why. Yeah. And uh, they were Jewish. And they got. he then, Paul, encouraged the whole of the theatre to chant, get the F out to the these Jewish yeah, shocking, men. Shocking, it's shocking. just shocking. Look, t today's Union Jackass is the Bank of England. It's a double bumper for Carol. Thank you very much. Oh, no, it's not. It's this guy, Paul Curry. There. <laughs> yeah, I, was say, I would have shared right, it with right. her. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm off. I'll see you tomorrow at nine. Wonderful people. <laughs> a brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, very good evening to you. Alex Burke, you're here again with your latest GB News weather forecast. It will be a bit chilly for some of us tonight with some showery rain around, but it's tomorrow 